Hello everyone, my name is Adam Michael Anthony Simpson and you're watching my YouTube channel Adam M.A. Simpson. Today's episode features two graduate students, Fola and Solomon. Fola and Solomon are both the co-presidents of the Stanford Black Engineering Graduate Student Association, otherwise known as BEGSA. The main focus of this episode is to get to know these students, their research, and what they plan on doing on campus at Stanford to nurture their community of students, including me. <laughs> Fula is a PhD candidate in the School of Earth studying Energy Resources Engineering, and Solomon is a PhD candidate in the School of Engineering studying Chemical Engineering. I know that's like all over the place, but they're engineers studying engineering, nurturing engineers, and doing great work while they're here at Stanford. So please enjoy this episode. I had a lot of fun speaking with, with um, these two students and colleagues, and I hope you learn a lot about what students can do while pursuing their PhD to help their community and recruit other black engineers and other underserved students at Stanford or their respective graduate schools. So stay tuned and enjoy. So now we're gonna get into the what led you to graduate school section of this interview. So, uh, Fola. Uh, before pursuing your graduate studies, you got your Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. Please tell us your background and what galvanized you to pursue uh, graduate education in the States. All right, thank you for that amazing question. Um, I am from Nigeria. Um, I grew up my whole life and spent my whole life in Lagos. Um, you know, I always thought, I, I was never quite sure of what I wanted to study mm -hmm. while in secondary school, um, but I figured I really do enjoy math and chemistry, so I guess I'll do the chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, found myself in there and it was, it was really quite interesting. It was one of those things where the stars just align um, you randomly pick something and it just works out and you love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so in my fourth year, I did an internship at Chevron. I worked in the reserves and reservoir management framework unit. And during that internship, I sort of, you know, um, was attached to different teams in the business. And in my, my time, um, that in the time that I spent with the process engineering team, on the gas plant in Escravos, um, I really saw like how upstream oil and gas worked. And it just, I remember it just bothered me how there was just this huge stack that was just constantly burning mm -hmm. <laughs> gas. And I thought this could not be good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd always <clears throat> known that, you know, I really wanted to do something in energy, especially looking at natural gas, because we have ample natural gas resources in Nigeria and also like a very large population and an immense energy or electricity system problem. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how all of those intersected, when the time came to apply to grad school, um, I just thought, you know, I would do some research, Come, came across what I do, like the field that I'm in now, carbon mm -hmm. capture and sequestration. And I thought, you know what, this is perfect. And I decided to apply. And again, the stars just aligned. Ah, awesome. <laughs> I like that story. And so, Solomon, <clears throat> uh, you two went to the University of Lagos. Please tell us of your background and what led you to pursue graduate studies here at Stanford. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, similar to Fala, I spent all of my years before Stanford in Nigeria. And, uh, I would say I was first drawn to research in, in my third year in undergrad during one of our breaks. 
I got the opportunity to work with a couple of other students on a project uh, that involved the conversion of shea butter nuts into shea butter mm-hmm. and the rigor of the process of trying to trying to figure out what was going wrong as we were doing this research project was something that really cleared me into research. I liked the the tempo of, of working super fast, making mistakes, and also having to figure out why those things weren't working. Mm-hmm. So uh, following that, I, I did my undergraduate thesis on solar thermal heating and the use of phase change materials for the storage of energy in solar thermal heating. And this this same process, I experienced the same process, the ups and downs of research, the problems of having to figure out things that don't work and the motivation and the excitement that get, that, that just comes to you when things eventually work. Finally, sort of solidified my interest in pursuing um, a PhD. Uh, so so after, after graduating from, from college, I really wanted to continue along the line of solar energy. So I applied to, to, to do that at Stanford and luckily I, I got it. So awesome. That's how I got to it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Paula, <clears throat> uh, could you give us a brief explanation of your research on electricity demand growth forecasting and capacity expansion modeling on the various <laughs> transition scenarios in the emerging Nigeria economy. I'm sure this has some um, relation to your work with Chevron in Nigeria or some inspiration to that. So please, please glean us on your research. Oh, you're mute. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. It was, it was, it's quite a mouthful, I know. Um, like I said, I got really interested in carbon capture and sequestration. Um, and during my master's here at Stanford, I did research that focused on techno-economic analysis of um, various means of decarbonizing the local oil industry here in California. <laughs> And so now, um, uh, and then I got really interested uh, as I was learning along the way, you know, about the field and that specific area of research. Um, I got super interested in energy systems modeling, especially for large scale electricity systems. And um, it's always just been super interesting to me how it takes not just technology, because the science is is great, it's fantastic. There's so many great scientists and researchers researchers here at Stanford and across the world answering very important problems but you need um you, you know you need the economics to to work you need those um sort of financial incentives to align and you also need really great policy makers to make good decisions that that are in the best interest of the welfare of people and so um I've just always been more interested in the intersection of economics, the technology, science, and the policy. Um, So again, I I was initially motivated to apply to grad school because I I, I was interested in answering problems, developmental problems that concern Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa generally. And so um, it, it just became, I thought the Nigerian market is super interesting. Oh, I think it is super interesting. And so it was a no-brainer that I would study this. Um, Nigeria has ample natural gas resources, Mm -hmm. like I mentioned. Um, It also has a large economy, a huge energy access problem. Um, But at the same time, if you think about it in terms of development, um, and the clean energy transition that's going on globally, it's it, there's a unique opportunity that's presented in trying to meet the energy needs um, of the people of the country, especially as the population keeps growing. And there's, you know, the country is trying to also um, cover the great dearth in energy um, access and, you know, deal with the energy poverty problem um, that we could do this sustainably right from the get-go and really take advantage of um, of sustainable technologies and make good decisions right now so we are not stuck with stranded assets that are mm-hmm. unsustainable and just compounding the emissions problem into the future. 
And so looking at how we can use already existing resources to make that transition easier as we plan future electricity and generally energy um, capacity is really the crux of what my research is, is about. And so thinking about how one could incorporate things like carbon capture and sequestration um, with natural gas, leverage natural gas infrastructure that exists and that's already been planned for development um, and think about you know the hydrogen economy and how gray hydrogen could possibly be made using natural gas fuel switching you know replacing some natural gas with hydrogen to make the combustion um, stream cleaner I'm um, thinking about what you know possible future carbon policy and carbon markets could look like again there's ample oil and gas reservoirs in Nigeria could Nigeria possibly in the future, in a future carbon market be, you know, the hub for CO2 storage? Could Nigeria be a key player in hydrogen in the hydrogen supply chain into the future? Um, how would, you know, things like a global carbon price or regional carbon market in sub-Saharan Africa impact the optimal energy decisions that go into capacity planning and, you know, capacity expansion? as we consider the Nigerian um, electricity sector and the West African sub-Saharan energy markets generally. Wow. <laughs> okay, I see you're ready for your dissertation. <laughs> that was well said. Um, so I'm going to move on to Solomon. Could, <laughs> could you also give us a brief explanation of your research on synthesizing atomically precise interfaces for lithium metal batteries? Uh, what is the application of this technology and how will it impact society at large? Thanks, thanks, Adam. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to start off by saying that my work is not even half as interesting as all of us, but <laughs> Uh, the long and short of it is, as we begin to try to enable renewable energy technologies and we try to transition towards the adoption of, of renewable energy technologies from the use of EV to renewable energy storage, uh, the storage of these energy sources and energy that we get from the sun and all of these uh, sources is becoming more and more important. And the current energy storage systems that we have, uh, electrochemical energy storage system, rely heavily on lithium ion batteries. But the thing is with lithium ion batteries, we've sort of maxed out on practical capacity. So lithium metal batteries, which, is, which are a big part of what I work on, come into play in the sense that they uh, almost triple the energy density of lithium ion batteries. And lithium lithium metal as an anode material in comparison to the anode materials present in the batteries that we use in our phones today have about 10 times uh, the specific uh, gravimetric capacity. So the, the question really then becomes why haven't lithium metal batteries been adopted today? And the answer to that is lithium metal batteries are, are very unstable. A stable as a result of the fact that lithium has a very low electrochemical redox potential, implying that when it's in contact with almost any material, it reacts with the material. So in, in lithium metal batteries, you have all of these interfacial instabilities. You have lithium at its interface with the, the electrolyte uh, exuding this, these instabilities. Lithium at the interface with the current collector it also exudes a lot of into these stabilities. So my research is focusing on designing thin films, precisely designing thin films that address the instabilities of lithium metal. Mm -hmm. So I, I you know, sort of use some, some techniques like atomic layer deposition and molecular layer deposition uh, to de design films that I expect to have specific properties that are compatible with lithium metal. The big picture is that if we can stabilize lithium metal batteries, we can unlock an unprecedented amount of energy storage. Think about charging your electric vehicle once and having it go three times the current distance that it goes. Uh, that alleviates you know, stress on uh, drivers, uh, reduces 
driving rates of anxiety and, and things like that. So that's the long and short of my research. Hmm. That's very interesting, and I love, um, I love how important both of your research uh, topics will be in in the near future as we try to address uh, climate change as the biggest uh, feat that we have for this century. So um, I hope to see some, you know, like, I don't know, equations or some things that have your name on it. (laughs) Okay, so uh, we're going to go into the second half of this um, interview. Thank you for watching part one of this episode with Fola and Solomon. Please stay tuned for part two coming up soon. And please like and subscribe and click the notification button.